Welcome to all of our .NET friends out in um, viewership land. Uh, this is another episode of the On .NET Live Show, where our mission is to empower you, the .NET community, to achieve more. I'm your host, Scott Addy, and I'm joined by co-hosts Cecil Phillip and Cam Soper. I'd like to welcome today's guest, John Alexander. And John, I, I know we go way back. I know who you are but I'm going to ask you to briefly introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Hi, Cecil. Hi, Cam. Hi, everybody. I'm John Alexander. Um, I have had a love for coding ever since I was a wee lad way back in the day, if I can say that, and uh, have about 25, almost 30 years of experience uh, starting in the mainframe world and then moving on to the Microsoft stack and then through ASP.NET, through uh, .NET itself, um, and then uh, had, my own, had my own consulting company, was a Microsoft Regional Director and MVP for many years before joining Microsoft on the .NET Docs team, which is where I met Scott and Cam, and um, then moving over to ML.NET for Docs lead there and some Azure ML. And then finally to, to autonomous systems uh, to lead the advocacy team. So, and now I'm kind of doing private consulting on generative AI and all sorts of stuff right now. So cool stuff. Awesome. I hear that's the new hotness, generative AI. So <laughs> we're here to talk about COBOL.net is what I understand. You mentioned your <laughs> right. background. Right. Well, actually, so. no, we're talking about, um, we're talking about um, Box Pro. Oh, 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 Fox Pro. Oh, my goodness. Hey, right. good. Fox Pro. So I actually, my first language that I that I learned and I actually got paid to write code for was not Fox I mean, Pro. Before but was, Sarcasm? Yeah, before Sarcasm. Fox. Was was one of the predecessors to Fox Pro. Um, so there was this whole family of database or flat file database oriented languages called the DBase languages, and they were all based on DBase, but there was also a compilable version of DBase called Clipper. And there was also Fox Pro and they all use the same file format and, and basically the same language. Um, so Clipper was like my first language and then I moved on to Fox Pro and then Visual Fox Pro, Visual Basic and C Sharp. I Very think cool. I'm sensing a movement in the chat. We're talking about slapping an LLM on Fox Pro. Um, I may excuse myself from this conversation. It's, it's going in a direction I never would have expected it to. Um, anyways, um, moving along to things that matter, minimal APIs. I think that's what we were here to discuss today. Um, we could potentially slap an LLM on that, I, I suppose. But uh, John, what do you want to talk about today with regards to minimal APIs and .NET? So what we're going to talk a little about, a bit about today, and there's kind of a play on words there from Marie Kondo with, uh, you know, the joy of minimalism with um, ASP.NET and minimal, uh, minimal APIs. And so what we're going to talk about today is um, I recently had a coding challenge and um, needed to um, explore the Reddit or basically listen to the Reddit.API and grab some users and posts and things like that. And I, I've been wanting to learn minimal API for a while. I've done a lot with traditional APIs. And so I used it as a learning learning challenge. And uh, so just created a little um, application that goes out and monitors ranked posts and the users themselves and brings that those posts back for a subreddit and also the users. And... Uh, also some status there on working with the Reddit API. And so what we'll talk about the today is kind of the challenge that I had learning that, some of the resources that I used to do that, and then um, some of the things I, I found uh, along the way. Um, and that's, uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of it. And uh, so, so, you know, if you, if, if you in the audience are interested in, in checking out this technology, we'll just kind of uh, play around with it and, um, you know, kind of, 
Just have a so John, this is actually a little relevant to me. So minimal APIs are um, it's one of those features that I I can recognize and look at that and go, oh look, you know, that's mapping an endpoint. Somebody's made a minimal API. But it's not, it's one of those things where I wouldn't know how to sit down and just code one, just like sitting down and writing it. I'm still thinking in terms of API controllers. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, when I, I had to kind of break myself, you know, and, and uh, paper train myself for this um, because it's a whole different, it's a really lightweight kind of almost like a, a Ruby or something like that. And so let's just kind of jump in real quick. If you, if you guys don't mind, um, if, if uh, you guys are good with that, let's just kind of walk through this and see, see a little bit of the strange, wonderful changes that take place within the minimal API. Um, and again, Scott and, and Cecil, you probably have way more experiences with this than, than I do, you know, only playing with it for a month or, or two. But it's good as, um, you know, developers and technology enthusiasts, they were always trying new things. And so that's kind of, you know, staying, staying alive in the code and, and playing around, just grabbing something and, and going for it, whether it's, you know, semantic kernel, which we could do in another, ep, uh, another, um, another episode on if you want guys, if you've played, have you guys played with semantic kernel at all? I have, I have not personally. It, it, we talked about it LLMs, but it's a way to take existing C um, sharp applications and chain, um, make a, make a chain for an LLM to be able to use that through some recipes and things like that. So you can then use the power of a generative AI right from an existing application. So we should, we should uh, maybe talk about that, uh, in a, in a future show. So is it a, is it a, an LLL, LLM wrapper? Is that what, how you would see No, it, it's or? a tool. It's a, it's a platform for accessing the API for an LLM, say a hugging face, which is a repository. And if you you in the audience don't know what an LLM was, if we can take just a moment, large language models are a variation of AI models that have been created and they're very good at predicting text and um, sentences, things like that. They've been trained on a lot of stuff, so they have a context for a lot of things and they can do some amazing things. And you've probably heard of chat GPT and things like that. But there are some tooling that we can use behind the scenes instead of just chat, typing in chat to the in chat in the browser to be able to access um, maybe your own private data, you know, data stores of some sort, other APIs to be able to create a composable application that can use this technology. Um, and so it is kind of an API wrapper, but it's it's really more of a of a framework or a, a technology plat a tooling platform. Okay. So, and it's it's from Microsoft. You can use either C Sharp or Python. And not to take time from 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 this, but maybe we should do a kind of an exploratory show, guys, in the next uh, next uh, few episodes or something, if you want. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Definitely well, keep that in mind. Yes. So, getting back to minimal APIs, notice that a couple of things here. We're just going ahead and creating our builder. Okay, no problem. We're adding our endpoints. Adding, in this case, I decided to use, because it's a prototype, we decided to use um, EF in-memory database to play with, okay? And I know there's a bit of, as they would say overseas, controversy about that, but, um, you know, it was fun to play with and learn. So creating a little DB context there using that in-memory database. And then I also added a swagger page because we all need we all need documentation, right? And so we all need a little swagger. <clears throat> we all need a little swagger. And if you're not familiar with that, um, this is what swagger gives you to that generative post, and it gives you information about an API, and you can run it there and see what comes back. In this case, we're going to be getting back ranked posts for a given subreddit. And then the user, how many users have have um, have uh, done something while the program, while the application is running? And so we also have some schemas here that we're passing back and forth via JSON for the post itself. You know, when was it created? The title, the name of the post, the author, um, the URL, how many upvotes it has in Reddit, score things like that. And then for the user, really all we're interested in is the name and how many posts that they've actually had right now. So 
this gives you a nice little way using Swagger to be able to document your API, and, and, it, and it really stays up to date as you change things. So that's that's pretty cool. So, okay. so let me let me ask you this. Sure, so ask me how, anything. You know, Cam, I'm an open book. Ask me anything you want. So uh, how do you end up choosing the Reddit API as so so you know you you were asked to do this coding exercise uh -huh. how how do you end up settling on Reddit's API as because they as said what use the Reddit about? API and do this oh that makes sense yeah 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 and so um I actually have in my um in, and I'll pull up the GitHub repo uh for this little application I've got a whole page on exactly how to go out. The, uh, you have to use uh, a little bit. It's kind of weird how the authentication works, but um, we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, but you kind of have to authenticate in in the back end to Reddit to actually play around with this. But it was it was a fun challenge. It was kind of a uh, interesting and um, unexpected to start with. So I just said, you know what? I've been wanting to learn minimal API. I'm just going to do it. And unfortunately, the uh, prospective employer um, didn't like that. He, they wanted a they were thinking they they wanted a traditional API, and I was like, hmm. okay, well, all right, you know, whatever. So that's so, that, that's, that's interesting. So John, yeah, one well, thing they, I, wanted... I mean, I think that I think that maybe in an enterprise situation or something, they just and you know we'll give everybody grace. They they just thought that maybe um it wasn't you know they talked to their doctor and it wasn't right for them right now or something you know. <laughs> John, one thing I wanted to take a look at here was your uh, your project file over in Visual okay. Studio. Uh, sure. I wanted to, to answer a couple of questions that folks may be wondering at this point in the conversation. For one, they may want, be wondering, well, which version of .NET is John using here? And so, very good question. So let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Um, in this case, I'm using .NET seven for this. And if I recall, minimal APIs was introduced not in .NET seven, but I believe it was six. I believe, yeah, it was it was six, and then several improvements in seven. And okay. now you can use um, one of the things that I haven't put in here, but I'd like to, and maybe you know, some night we've had. Uh, for those in the audience, you guys don't know it, and Cecil, Cecil, you're more than welcome to join us. We've had some late night hacking sessions on different things, just goofing off and, and playing around, and had a lot of had a lot of fun doing that. Um, so you can add. They have added the anti-forgery tech uh, tech to that now. In dot in uh, dot net eight. Very cool. Um, yeah. Okay, so project file. So let me stop this project. Yeah, project file. So you're using dot net seven. The other thing I wanted to look at though was the the NuGet package that you're using to enable this test experience that you've showed us in the browser. Okay. Well, let's start with the API. And let's go into the project file. Let me pin this. I uh, should be able to just, yeah, there you there go. go. Yep. Edit so, project file. Uh, so it's this, it's line 14 that I wanted to draw attention to this swashbuckle package mm -hmm. that's enabling this browser based test experience. Uh, just for folks that are wondering. Um, the other thing, though, that I think is worth taking a look at here is um, kind of mapping what you see on that test page to the APIs or endpoints that you have defined in your program CS file, just so folks can put, you know, kind of map those things together in their minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we've got, I mentioned we were using the end memory, uh, the end memory data store for Entity Framework Core. And in this case, we're also using, and I'll show this, this is a little, a nice little C-sharp wrapper for the Reddit API um, that's available in a GitHub repo. Really, really straightforward, pretty easy to use. Very, very full featured. Um, and they also have a, what's called a little application that we'll see called an auth token um, retriever live. So you can go ahead, you sign up uh, as a developer at Reddit and get your uh, your tokens, and then you can use this then to authenticate your program. So, 
And let's just look at the programs. Let's also talk about the the architecture of this and what I some of the things that I chose to do, if that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. um, so here, I've got this pre this um, a little sample of case that really came from Reddit.net, and I have uh, we'll see we'll see his repo here in just a minute. Um, but basically. Actually, I'll go into this here in a little bit. Let's just talk about the structure first. So I have my we have our auth token receiver to handle the initial authentication that will give you you send in your um, access token, and it will get or your request token and give you back your access token. Okay, so we also have the main API, and that's that's has our program CS that's really kind of the beating heart, the control center of everything that we're doing. All right, and then. Um, our app setting is JSON, which is where we're, we're storing our creds. Um, and then I, I also segmented it out into more of a common library in case maybe we wanted to use this, this functionality, maybe, you know, you know, in a, um, in a console app or something else to, to be able to monitor that. So, um, the dependencies there. And so I started with some configuration there. So that there's our app ID, and that's what you when you set this up and run it, you give it an app ID, or actually it creates it for you, and you have you can name it, and then you have your refresh token, your access token, and also you can pass in the subreddit you want to monitor. So if you're into, you know, the one we'll use, it's all so because it, it shows things very quickly. But like if you're into gaming or soccer or, you know, poetry or recipes, there's a, a Reddit for you. I read it for everyone. <laughs> so, hey, John, um, quick question for you then. Like, so that auth yeah. token retriever, is that like a separate console application? Is that what that yeah. is? Or... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's get through this and then I'll pop back up to auth token receiver. Okay. And so, just this kind of just the segmentation. So, I have a configuration here. I went ahead and, and for our the models or working with grabbing things out of the API. And then putting putting them into the in-memory database. Notice there's a couple things here that jump out, right? Um, notice we talked, Scott. You were talking about the the swagger and how you keep it up to date. Um, you don't necessarily have to put this in here, but it gives it more. It it shows more on the swagger page for documentation purposes. If you put a little decorator called swagger swagger schema, say that three times fast. And give it a little information about what you're what you're dealing with here, okay. And then I also here have my DB context um, for creating that particular in-memory database for um, the ranked posts themselves. And then my DB set here for ranked posts. And the same thing really with the subreddit user. And I just realized. How come you have a different context for each of those models? Um, mainly because and that's a good question. I was confused by that, but it said that if you're working with things asynchronously, which I am, you shouldn't be hitting from separate con. You shouldn't be hitting separate. Uh, basically, making separate requests through that same context asynchronously because you can lock everything. Is what I understood. And that's that was one of the things that I was going to say that I discovered um, sure. is that that's a no-no. So that's why I have a separate context for this. Hmm. Got it. Okay. It's a good question, Cecil. You're always, you're always asking such insightful questions. I'm paying awesome. attention. I'm paying attention. You're you're <laughs> awesome. You're just <laughs> awesome. Okay. So we've got our models here, and then we've got our services that use the models. So let's take a look at the ranked post API. Well, actually, let's start with the Reddit wrapper. It, it's the DJ and the wrapper here. So, um, so we've got Reddit, which is our Re our Reddit.net API, and there's some controllers that it has, some events that it, it's using, and then we're using our models and a utility for status that we'll take a look at. Um, so really quickly, just go in and configure our subreddit user database and our post database here, so that we have this. And then go through and grab our creds. And then if there's any problem with that, I'll throw 
a null exception there. And then we spin up the Reddit client, which is going to take care of the communication between the Reddit API and grabbing our information that we want. And it even has a translate Reddit exception. So I had a little fun with that and I'll show that in a minute. The main page of the API shows the status right now of whether or not Reddit, the Reddit API can, can be accessed. So, and then um, it also gives you some really nice event handling to be able to monitor um, for in this case, like new posts, or you can do top posts or anything like that. So I'm just monitoring every half second, grabbing that information. And then when we're done, stop monitoring that. And so inside the, um, the event itself, our event handler, I'm just going through and grabbing my post and then adding into my database the relevant information here for title, score, the URL, things like that. And then I'm also grabbing and checking the user itself to see if we've already we've already grabbed them to to keep track of how many posts they've done. Oops, I don't want to put that there. Let, let me ask you a question real quick, John. You're yes. so you said you're in the event handler um, for 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 what event uh, again? For this is for the post updated event provided by that Reddit.net. Um, library so you don't have to pull the the actual reddit api or anything it, it's actually just sitting there doing asynchronous right it's pushing events back okay yes yep and that's really the heart of it right there um so the really it's pretty straightforward then i'm grabbing uh one of the things that you can do also is return a status along with what you're what you're sending back. And in this case, if it's okay, I'm just throwing it back there, and then grabbing from my data structure the score title permalink, and I'm also adding the permalink. Just has it's a relative API that Re that Reddit gives you. So I'm putting Reddit.com on there in case you want to go ahead and and be able to click on that URL or something like that. and then order that by descending on the score. And that's pretty much all that that is. And that will give us the, and we'll see in a moment, the results from the, the posts themselves. So and John, then, at, yeah. so you have this okay method here on typed results. Does that return a 200 status yep. code? Yep. Okay. So I'm wondering what would happen in this method if, some exception occurs great question so it would probably get thrown over to my reddit my reddit handler and handle it um that way actually that's in let's see that's in configuration actually let's go back up there da, 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 da. no it's in reddit wrapper here at the top. Actually, I don't have a, I missed that try catch. Good catch, Mr. Addy. It should be here. That's why they keep me around. That is, <laughs> all right. Got Addy on the keyboard, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Okay, so, so that will be changed. So we assume the happy path there that a, a success status yep. code would be returned. Uh, right, and so what you could actually even do here would be to put a quick if statement in here and check the status that way, you know, if it's not equal to 200, then return an error or something like that and do it and do it that way. Right. And this uh, typed results uh, type, where does that come from? Is that from the, the subreddit stats namespace? It's not one that I'm familiar with. That is uh, actually okay. from ASP.NET core HTTP results. That answers my question. Yep, and I found that's one of the things I have found, and I was going to uh, talk a little bit about. We might as well talk it now. Talk about it now. It's um, it's really just the it gives you a really nice hand uh, 
factory for typing out your um, different status messages. You know, you could probably even add I'm a teapot in here or something like that. So really, really kind of nice there. And something that's actually in, um, I learned that trick, boys and girls, from, let's see here. Here's reddit.net. We'll come back to this in a moment. But this is the, well, actually, might as well talk about it now. Um, this is the this is the C Sharp API um, called reddit.net. And it, it really handles pretty much everything you need, especially if you're, if you're, it's, it's made really to maintain your own. So if you're, if you're running a subreddit and you're, you know, and you're managing users and posts and things like that, it's really what it's for, but you can also use it to monitor your own um, Reddit interests if you want to. Really nice. And um, it's got an MIT license. So that's always, that's always great. Right. Um, so that you can use it however you want to. Um, Got some fairly nice documents here and some examples to get started on. And there's, um, and we'll actually, we'll go up and talk about how we authorize the new user here in just a moment, but a lot of different nice um, examples. If you, if you want to interact with the Reddit API, you know, you want to link to a self post or get posts from a permalink, you can do that. So just really nice uh, here showing you grabbing the Reddit client like we had, passing in that permalink or URL, doing a match to find, in this case, the comments because Reddit has comments. And this, this is, a, like I said, a really nice, easy way to do that. And it's, it's, in, it's in NuGet. And grab it and, and go. Um, but to get back to your typed, uh, typed result, um, Damien Edwards, you guys know Damien. He has a really nice minimal API playground. And um, the, I believe this is where I found the type results that, yeah. So this is where this is where I found that little trick was in the helper classes here. And I was like, okay, so what's that? And he even has custom I result objects in here and all sorts of really, really cool stuff. So, and they've got, um, he's got the IANA forgery that I kind of talked about that's, that's coming out. Um, all sorts of things in here. And so this is, this is the main thing I learned to kind of play with between, between this and um, then playing around with the red.net. And then um, this was a nice, um, the .NET Tools bot and JetBrains has a nice little, really, um, really uh, simple, nice little tutorial to kind of explain things. But I must say, Damien does a really, really nice job in minimal API playground on that. And I know I'm jumping around a lot, so I'll stop and for questions or what have you. Yeah, John, one question I have. So I know you've probably uh, done this sort of thing with controllers before the more traditional approach. What uh -huh. are some of the benefits you saw in moving from that traditional approach to this minimal approach? Um, some of the benefits I saw was that it, it, if we look at the, if we go back to the code, it's, um, it's good and bad because everything is in one spot. So it's really easy to just crank something out pretty quickly and start playing with it. Like you do in some of the, some of the other, um, you know, some of the other languages, like I said, like Ruby or something like that. Um, but it really, uh, what I liked was the ability to just have everything like right here and just do, you know, do everything in this and just, and just kind of go to town and then use, you know, use, t um, you know, kind of segment things out into, into organize, you know, for organizational purposes as I need to, but everything was kind of here. So, we talked in the like, for example, the Reddit wrapper um, to configure our processing there, grabbing the, the things from the um, from the uh, app uh, settings.json, and then once I do that, configuring the database, the, the and then starting the monitoring, 
and then going to town and then um, stopping the monitoring after we get done. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's really, really flexible. Um, but you kind of have to really think about what you're doing. It's, 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 it's simple and flexible, but then with um, dependency injection, you just kind of really have to think, think through what you're, what you're trying to do there. Yeah. So I'm like, in my mind, I'm trying to map this to the traditional approach for viewers. So for example, uh -huh. I see there's a map get method. Yep. The alternative in the traditional world would be something like an HTTP get attribute that you would apply mm -hmm. uh, to an action method. Uh, so I assume there's a, a map method for each major HTTP verb that's supported post, for example, there's probably a map post. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, um, there is there, um, you know, we actually guys, what we should do, we should get together and hack on this and then, and then show and do, uh, do this as a traditional API, have a version of this as a traditional API mm -hmm. and then compare and contrast. Yeah, and I think, you know, so what you're showing here is is obviously an opinionated approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the traditional controllers, nothing wrong with using them. Uh, if that's what you'd prefer to use, great, go that route. What John's presenting here, I think, is more appealing to folks who are coming from, say, like a Node.js background where they're used to something like Express. Mm -hmm. uh, to, the, to someone like that, what you're showing, John, is probably much more approachable. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. with the traditional controller approach, they're, they're probably seeing that and wondering why so many moving parts um, to accomplish what I can do in very few lines of code with something like Express from the Node ecosystem. I know Python has something similar to this in the name of what they have over there that's mm -hmm. most popular is escaping me. It's uh, Flask. 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 There we go. Yep. Yeah, it's very. This is kind of a, very similar to a Flask app, um, and so, you know, it's more along the lines of those types of architectures. And there's, yeah, there. It's it has its 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 strengths and its weaknesses. You know, you when you're doing the traditional approach, and and once again, I I did this to just learn about this technology. I'm not saying this was probably even the best way to go. But it was fun to play around with it. Um, but where was I going with that? Sorry. In your, you know, your your more traditional methods, you have everything structured out, and you can kind of see the the flow really, really easily, right? I mean, there's the chain of evidence, if you will, all the way down with your traditional um, API as you're flowing through the controllers and you're flowing routing all over the place. Yep. And you can see that. Um, and one of the things I would recommend as you're working with this technology, and one of the things that really helped me was looking at Damien's, uh, Damien's tests to play around with those. And um, the test platform adapter that you can that you can use now within um, you know Visual Studio is really, really, really cool. And um, it allows you to, to really link in to your existing app and use those things without having to mock them up through the web application factory. And have you guys talked about this stuff on, on your show before? I don't believe we have. Uh, so okay, so this is kind of, sure. this is really new. And this is something else I found on, on in um, the, the minimal API playground. And so basically, if we're testing this, it creates a web application factory around my um, program up here and creates my minimal API. And then I can run, get ranked posts and check that response and make sure in this case that it's bringing back a 200 for that, for this particular test. And the same way with get ranked subreddit users And swagger just to say, okay, it's okay. And then for the status response, I kind of, I kind of wimped out. And just as long as the it says the string of, you know, all systems are go. And it's it's got some really cool things in it. Like you can read 
as strings asynchronously. And it's a, it's a really powerful thing. So um, what I'm going to do, Scott, is create, I didn't get a chance to do it, it create a resource sheet for all these things and send it over to you guys with some different links around these. This is kind of bleeding edge right here. Um, and really, really powerful um, to be able to, to start testing your things out without having to mock those. And it just, it just runs behind the scenes. But because it, in some ways with the dependency injection and everything, it running just behind the scenes, there's a, there's a bit of magic involved in trying to make sure when you're doing, uh, when you're debugging and things like that, it can get a little confusing. So, so John, I, one other thing I'm wondering about is uh, using a controller, um, you typically define what the, the root URL is, uh, mm -hmm. what the root relative URL is, slash API, for example. Are you defining that somewhere here in your your program? Um, it's, file? The, it's the map kit is is really the routing. Got it. Got it. And so, so in other words, if you were to run this uh, this API locally, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to see like slash API in the URL. You you truly are routing directly to get ranked posts to hit that yeah. operation. Yeah. So if we if we actually if we if we let me stop this. I guess we we'll continue. Come on. And so you can see here, it's just localhost and from Kestrel and subreddit are all monitoring status because that's what, that's the subreddit, right? All systems go. And if we look back over at the map get for this, if it's, you know, just your default. Yeah, just the root root and the subreddit pulling in monitoring status and the status message so it's real that's one of the things that's really really cool um you know you're just pushing it and, and basically what this is calling here is in my um api let's see in my services it's just get ranked post and return based on the select and I am going through and, and uh, grabbing that and then modifying it a little bit on the way back out to have the, you know, clickable, clickable URL as we go along. Gotcha. So, so John, I want to piggyback off of Scott's question a little bit. Okay. So you'd mentioned that you, you've only been playing with it for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So being someone that's, you know, used to the traditional way, right, the controller way of doing things, mm -hmm. do you see any, like, patterns out of the box that you're like, well, if I'm going to build a minimal API with you know a significant amount of endpoints, like these are some of the patterns, or these are some of the ways that you like to structure your applications. Yeah, I think I think starting with, you know, keeping I, I, behind the scenes. I as you notice, like I guess still like a lot of artifacts, right? Um, you know, I like to split, segment things out into a common library and mm -hmm. then segment them out by um, you know, what we're doing here or action really kind of, you know, or, or, um, discipline, whatever, I don't, I'm not sure what you would call that, but you know, that's, that's more traditional than anything. And I still think that has merit and value to be able to, to really track, you know, to really be able to kind of maintain this. Um, if that, if that answers your question, because you could you can literally do all of the everything if you wanted to in for the for the most part in program with a minimal API. And there's a there's a blog post that I saw or that I read that's really good and it's like it talks about six different use cases for minimal API. I don't have it up right now, but I'll put it in I'll make sure and put that in the resource um, resource guide. Yeah, the 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 concern that I would have going into writing a minimal API that I, I would want to solve right off the bat, um, and we had somebody comment on it way, way earlier in, in the discussion, is if we have a large set of APIs that are supported, how do we, you know, when we're dealing with controllers, we have a, a folder-based organizational scheme. It's really simple. We, you know, drop the controllers in, you know, organized in a directory tree. Um, but in, in this scenario, you know, um, you know, this person was pointing out that 
that you end up with with a class that's just a collection of static methods. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know that's that's something that you know, the patterns to work around that is something that I would want to have pretty clear in my head before I started. Yeah, um, I think you know this this is a very I think it's really a very specialized um, architecture. It, you know, in certain cases, it would work well for maybe you know microservices or something like that. Um, but I if I had a large if I had a large amount of APIs, like I've done with other things, I would go the I would go the controller con traditional route. Yeah, I think one thing that you know, just thinking through this, one thing I might consider if I have twenty or so different routes that I'm configuring here in Program CS, I might start to consider creating uh, classes with extension methods on them, and I might organize by domain. In the case of Reddit here, uh, maybe a post is a domain and I create a class for that. It's a noun, a post. Mm -hmm. I might do the same for user. So like we have a get ranked posts, get ranked subreddit users. Mm -hmm. I might extract those out into post and user API classes. Yep. And those classes might have static methods that I create as extension methods. So that mm -hmm. in my program CS file, it's a simple method that I'm calling an extension method to wire up those API routes. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great idea. I will say that um, reddit.net, they have, um, the way they've handled, um, they're not using middle API, but the way that they've done is, is something very similar to what you've said. They're, they have, um, they, they have things. So like subreddit and post and, you know, so that's more of how we would, we might segment that out. That's, you know. Yeah. So I think the, the appropriate answer to the question that we popped up on the screen earlier was it depends. I'm going to give you. It the really control, does. And that's what I was trying. I was trying to say so poorly. It really does depend. Yep. Depends and on there are so ahead. many different factors. It really does. You know, as a, again, talk to your doctor and see if it's right for you. <laughs> um, your mileage may vary and all those other dis disclaimers. But if you're, especially like you said, if you're coming from um, a node background or something like that, or maybe a flask background, this is something to kind of take a look at and at least, you know, it's a, it's a way to learn the, the technology. But there are some really interesting things that, that, um, that are going on here. And, and I learned a lot, especially, like I said, from the minimal API playground. Um, and actually what he's done is he's, um, this is something that I was thinking about implementing and I wanted to talk about real quick. And this would be another way to handle it. I just thought of that is that he's, um, you know, gr basically creating his endpoints on the fly. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a, it's a brave new world of all sorts of different things. And, you know, you can go, he's got, you know, an open API um, configuration in here. So, I mean, he took it, they've taken it way down. And I think maybe even David Fowler's playing with this, or I know that David's done a ton on talking about this in on his, on his, um, his GitHub repo. So, um, but this is, like I said, this was just a little experiment to, to go, okay. Um, since it's a, you know, it was something that was, uh, contained, working very, you know, very small set of, of um, API, a, a very, a very minimal API to start with, if you will, you know, only a, only a couple of services there. I thought, what the heck, and I'll, I'll try it and, and, and learn something new. Yeah. Yeah. Do we want to take a few, we've got a few questions here uh, from the audience. Sure. Um, we have this first one. So, and, and I'm not completely sure what the question's asking here, but I think what I think what what they're asking is uh, that they want to see the um, the method signature of map get to to understand how that works a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> so so. 
when we map get, we are mapping an endpoint. I mean, the properties mm -hmm. it takes a it takes an endpoint and um and well, if you can hop back over to program just so we can see the code, just yeah. so look, so we're yeah. giving it uh, an endpoint first, right? Yep. So so slash get ranked posts, for example, and what's that second parameter do? That's uh, the um, second. That's the handler is our handler. Okay. Yep. So, so we're we're mapping. We are we are literally just mapping an endpoint to a callback, basically, uh -huh. and, and giving it a, a little decorator as to what it's going to return. Yep. And so this is basically this, what this is is an endpoint builder, and so it produces the type that you're that you're going to pass back. Okay. So, so it's all the magic of a of the 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 definition of a con API controller class that has like the attributes and all that, but we've, we've condensed it basically to one line. Right. Dehydrated it, you know, right. Easy so, to eat, ready to eat, you know? So another viewer asked a question that popped to mind for me too. What are we doing with, with versioning? Do you know anything about how that works in a minimal API? I know, I know you're kind of new, new uh, to minimal APIs, John. I, right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a way to handle it, but I don't know off the top of my head, what it, what it would look like. Um, I think what you would do is have another, you would probably start with what I would say would be probably putting straight out of the box, something like this. Right. Mm -hmm. So you, you, so if, if we were using like, you know, Scott mentioned extension methods earlier, you could have like multiple static classes that are just full of extension methods that. Right that are you know by version yeah i mean this is that's how i would probably handle it just you know based yeah. on based on my experience and smelling things like that let's uh if you don't mind let's pop back over to the minimal api playground and see if they've so there's actually a package in the the .NET organization um it's called asp.net api versioning um and i think it works with all of the models. So it'll work with controllers, it'll work with minimal, uh, but I don't think there's anything like directly out of the box that does that. But I know there is a, a package of the .NET repo. Uh, there is, I believe it shipped in ASP.NET Core 7. There's a concept called endpoint groups. Someone in the chat has actually uh, alluded yeah, to this. There's the map group yeah. method. That's one approach you could take um, to help facilitate the versioning aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I think versioning, it, we could, we could be debating about tabs and spaces. I mean, hell we right. may as well if we're going to talk about versioning, but you know, some are in the camp of you, you version with a string in the URL. Others say that's not the way to do it at all. And you do it through a request header. Um, I, I truly think the answer depends on your overall application architecture and the constraints that are set forth in your environment by your architecture team. Yep, I would agree. So one of the things here that you could do, um, and somebody, uh, Osney, said you can create a map group here. And I just looked in in Damien's and he's got an example of that. And so um, it's a way to. Yep, we have folks in the chat. Um, again, it becomes a tabs versus spaces debate. Yep. We do have folks yep. saying they're using request headers. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was able to dig up, I'm gonna share this in the chat with folks. One of our MVPs wrote a blog post on this map uh, group approach that we were discussing. Um, I would take a look at that and just evaluate whether that approach makes sense for your team or not. Again, talk to your architect and see if it's right for you. But, you know, we, we give you the tools and the framework. It's up to you to determine how you hold those tools, how they're right. put to use in your applications. Yep. And that brings up a good point. And this was totally just an experiment for me, you know, um, just, to, just to learn it. 
and to see, you know, just kind of start evaluating it. And, you know, I think it might be of benefit if uh, we want to do that to, to take something like this and, and turn it into a traditional API mm-hmm. and then c- kind of do a compare and contrast. So yeah. with, without having done that exercise, mm-hmm. let me just ask you a shoot from the hip. It, next time, next time somebody says, John, I want you to write an API, but I don't care how you do it. Are, mm-hmm. are you going to do it with controllers or minimal API? I'll probably use controllers. Um, just because it's a little, it's, it, well, again, it depends, Cam, it depends. It really depends on what, if they're like, it's just one service, it's this or that or the mm-hmm. other, or, you know, if it, if it leans more toward that, um, you know, like a flask architecture or something like that, I, I may use minimal API. I don't know. Mm-hmm. My, my gut would say almost, and he heard me wimp out and say controllers, you know, because that's what we're, that's what we're totally used to. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Old, old old habits are hard to break. That's right. That's I could right. definitely see how you know. I think I think uh, you know. We keep mentioning Flask and and Node. This would be certainly I think a lot easier for somebody from that background to, to mm-hmm. just to just grok right off you know without even having to to really get into it. Yeah, I think yeah. there's there's also the camp in in the .dot net world that says I really don't like the magic of the conventions in the MVC framework. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, the classes must must be suffixed with the term controller unless mm-hmm. you configure it otherwise. Um, just all of the glue that's necessary to make the moving parts work together. Uh, sometimes that's enough to make people run for the hills screaming. Um, and I think for that camp, the minimal APIs are very appealing. There, there's far less magic going on. That, that was actually a discussion we were having out in the audience. Um, I can't remember the, I can't find the comment on, on the fly like this, but I believe it was Victor had commented something like they really prefer the, the, this, because there's no, there's no magic. And, and I counted, well, I kind of like the magic of NBC. I like having the, the convention over configuration um, uh, way of doing things. So yeah, we have both. Yep. And there's nothing wrong it's with good that. Good to have options. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Although there are legitimate concerns, like for example, we have right here concern that controllers have too much overhead. And and I could certainly I could certainly see that when you when you instantiate a controller, you're getting a whole lot of a whole lot of functionality built in. And I know there's some uh, benchmark testing data you can find out in the wild on controllers versus minimal APIs and what the difference is in performance. Um, mm-hmm. Do do evaluate that data if performance is of utmost concern for your team. Yep. Uh, but again, fewer moving parts and less magic most often translates to better performance. Again, it depends. It depends. Um, um, so John, we're we're at about the five minute mark. I wanted to ask, as you were going through this exercise, were there any other resources you found useful that you might share with uh, someone who was in your position, you know, trying to ramp up on minimal APIs? Uh, yeah, there. Like I said, there's this introduction to uh, minimal API, introduction to uh, core minimal APIs that came out not too long ago. Um, the minimal API oh, we playground. Know, we know down. Oh, I'm sorry. I said we know Khalid. We've had Khalid on the show. Cool. Um, the Reddit.net playing with that was fun, but that's really not about minimal APIs. But I've got a couple of different um, links I'll send over um, okay. that I, that I found extremely helpful. I just don't have. I apologize. I don't have them up right now. And uh, you know, it's it's uh, if you want to pull down my uh, let me get back over to my repo here real quick. Um, it's it's pinned at the top here. Let me go back over here. Subreddit stats, and you can you can pull it down and and try it out. And there's some prerequisites. Um, we didn't get around to talking um, Cecil about the security aspect, but it's pretty it's pretty straightforward how it how it works. And if so, if you follow the guide here, I, I've got. I've got it laid out pretty well, including troubleshooting. So, awesome. Yep. Well, 
Um, why don't we wrap things up? I, I think we've, we've covered a fair amount of ground today. I know I've learned a few things. Hope our viewers could say the same. I'd like to thank all of our viewers for tuning in again today, uh, giving us the last hour of your day. As a reminder, you can check out other .NET live TV streams like the one you watched today and videos out at dot.net slash live. We'll be offline next Monday in observation of Labor Day here in the States, but you can tune in again on September 11th when uh, Sean Walker, you might know him from .NET Nuke, he will join the show to talk to us about his open source CSS or CMS uh, and application framework called Octane. Um, this would be useful for .NET MAUI and Blazor with the various hosting models. If that's something that sounds interesting to you, we hope to see you on the 11th. Thanks, folks. See you then. Bye.